Welcome to the Down Dog Athletics Podcast, a competitor's guide to mental health and mastery. My name is Paul Kleen. I've known sports and training my entire life, but it wasn't until I worked on my mind that I finally started achieving what I believed I was capable of. When I combined mindful and spiritual practices to my already competitive demeanor, I gained a new level of clarity in life and traded my career at Amazon to start Down Dog Athletics. In this podcast, I interview top athletes and coaches to uncover the mindsets of top performers. You'll hear from doctors, authors, and experts in the health space as they break down how to take your mental health, physical health, and performance to the next level. And last but not least, you'll hear from me and my experiences and how I'm cultivating growth for myself and my clients, both mentally and physically. Let's go. What's up, everyone? Welcome to the Mindful Muscle Podcast, a competitor's guide to mental health and mastery. My name is Paul Klein, and I'm your host. And if you are listening to today's episode, you made it. You survived 2020. I know this has felt like the craziest year of all time for you. It probably is. It is akin to getting off a roller coaster that you're asking yourself what you signed up for as you went down the first drop. Kind of reminds me of uh, the two towers. If you watch Lord of the Rings, when they survive the Battle of Helm's Deep, and they're like, oh man, that was terrible. Now we just have the biggest battle of our lives ahead of us. And it kind of feels like that because we survived 2020 and that was the worst year ever, but now we're going into 2021 and we still got more work to do. And I'm really excited for today's guest because I think his perspective that he'll give you is going to help you as we go on into 2021. Tomorrow, if that you're listening to this on December 31st when it came out, is going to be a new year. It's going to be when we all start our new goals and his perspective on not delaying. And you'll find out why you don't want to waste time and why he's so motivated to get in as much as he can while he can. Um, but the reality is there's only so much time that we have on this planet. There's only so much time we have in the season that we're in in our lives. As much as we have a ton of time and it's smart to be patient, there's also a balance of like, let's get it done. Let's get to work. Uh, and so I'm really excited to have Joe Rinaldi on. Uh, he's a doctor of physical therapy. I've been on his podcast with him and Sam. We've had a lot of really great conversations around training, mental health, relationships, and just really striving to be our best. Um, and so he's going to come on and talk about routines, talk about different trends he's seeing in physical therapy around low back pain, um, his approach to really fitting everything in that he gets done, and he gets a lot done. Um, but his story at the very beginning is super powerful, so I'm really excited for you guys to listen to it. Uh, and be sure and get out a notepad, take down some notes, and apply them to this next year. So without further ado, here we go, Joe Rinaldi. Joe, what's up, brother? So good to have you on and connect after being on your podcast uh, a few months ago. Yeah, Paul, this is awesome. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm very excited. So it's Sunday that we're recording this. And usually during the week, I usually see some sort of like 3.45 a.m. <laughs> getting after it and I, I pulled up my stories joe you you were one of the, the first guys i'm like all right 6 a.m like i think you, you sent out a newsletter something like that yeah. and it's super motivating for me and being around people like you is always inspiring inspires me to be better but i want to have you talk about how you got into that kind of routine mm -hmm. and what helps you maintain it and then how that helps create balance in the other areas of your life. You're married. Uh, we were talking mm -hmm. about that off the, or off the uh, podcast and you have some clients, 40, 50 hours of clinic work, so much to fit in, but you get such a good head start. So give a little bit of background on that and, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Awesome. So I've always been an early riser. I mean, I was born at five o'clock in the morning. My parents tell me stories about me waking up at, at four or five in the morning as a child. I'd get up to watch Pokemon. It's my favorite show as a kid. Nice. And uh, so I, I've always had that kind of in my blood. I, my body would wake me up early in the morning, but it wasn't until graduate school where I really started taking that to the extreme and consistently getting up around four, 430, sometimes even earlier in the morning. And I think for me, that time, it, it's my time, right? Like the rest of the world is pretty much still asleep. So there are no distractions. It's just me, my thoughts, and whatever intentions I have for that time. 
And so as life has gotten busier, you alluded to the fact that um, I'm a physical therapist. I work hours in the clinic. I have coaching clients. I do a podcast. I write a blog and a newsletter. I'm married. So I have a lot going on. And that time in the morning is really where I'm able to be with myself, be intentional and set the tone for the day ahead. And so that morning routine for me usually starts around four. I'll wake up, I'll start a pot of coffee because that's a staple in my morning routine. And while the coffee's brewing, and this is actually, Paul, something that I started right after you were on our podcast. Um, but I do some box breathing and just a few minutes of meditation every morning. And uh, I think I had said on the podcast, you know, I dabble in meditation. And uh, you laughed and you explained why dabbling in meditation uh, isn't the best way to meditate. Um, and, and so I've been consistent with it over the past couple of months. And it's really been making a difference for me in the morning. I feel super grounded and just present. And so while the coffee's brewing, I do my meditation and then I journal. So I usually journal for about five to 10 minutes, kind of just dump my thoughts out on paper. I'll usually touch on a few key points. And one of those things is who do I want to be for the day ahead? And, and what kind of energy do I want to bring to the world? And that, uh, that was inspired by Sam Tooley, who I run the podcast with. And then on top of that, I'll think about things that maybe are going to be challenging in my day ahead. And, and I'll kind of uh, envision myself handling those things well, if they come up. Uh, once I get through the journaling and that process, I'll usually read a few pages of whatever book or books that I'm going through. And then I'll pick up my phone and I'm very intentional about doing all of those things before I pick up my phone. Then I'll pick up my phone, respond to client emails, text messages, uh, post my daily quote on Instagram and kind of get my, my day going that way. Yeah. And that's the cup of Joe, right? Correct. Yeah. Cup of is, Joe daily quote. Is that inspired by your journaling? Uh, you know what? It Not currently, but in the past when I first started journaling about three years ago, um, I'm a very structured person. And so I decided to lay out seven quotes every week ahead of time. And I would journal about each quote. Uh, and so I like to share the quotes with with the world and whoever's willing to, to entertain me just because I think uh, quotes are one of the things I love about life because there's so much wisdom packed into just a sentence or two, you know, somebody can distill um, something they've learned throughout their entire life into just a few sentences. And so I find quotes uh, very, very helpful to meditate on. Yeah, absolutely. You look at all the stoic philosophers and the different mm -hmm. books that are out on that or Ryan holiday, I remember a couple years back reading Marcus Aurelius's book, Meditation, Meditations, whatever. And most of it, I was like, this is way over my head. But there were a few things that I took out of that. Where do you get your inspiration from? It's a good question. I don't know if I have one specific person or, or group of people that I, I find my inspiration from. Uh, I think a lot of it just comes from growing up and dealing with what I've dealt with and, and basically... Uh, that is the loss of my eyesight. And so for anybody who's listening who doesn't know, right, I am losing my eyesight. I have a genetic condition and there's really not much I can do about it. And so I'm headed down that path and I've struggled with that. And so I think part of what, what drives me and inspires me is just I know that everybody's dealing with something and struggling with something. And I just want to be the best version of myself um, so that I could maybe someday inspire or help or, or encourage somebody who needs it the most. So I don't know if I have one specific person. It's kind of just my life experience, I guess. Which I think is the most authentic way mm. to share quotes. Um, yeah. When did you find out about that? Yeah, I was 10. I, I woke up one morning and I just, I was blind in my right eye. Uh, it was just out of nowhere. And that's how, that's how I found out. And we, I, we, I got diagnosed later that same day and, and had my first procedure done. You know, in the past, when I was 10, it was a laser surgery that would kind of stop the damage from getting any worse. And now it's injections that I'll get into my eye whenever I need them. Uh, and so the treatments kind of help slow things down, but, but they don't cure anything. How has your perspective evolved from age 10 to where you are now on it? Uh, it's, it's transformed. Oh man, I can't even, I can't even put it into words. I mean, at, at age 10, I was, I had, I felt pity for myself. I felt sorry for myself. Um, I felt like I was at a disadvantage. 
I was upset. I was frustrated. I was angry. I, I, any, any negative emotion you could feel, I felt. And um, I let it hold me back. And then as I grew up, as I went through school, I kind of fell into a rhythm. I got good grades, played sports to the best of my ability, made good relationships, had good friends, um, went to college, worked really hard and got through that time. And then when I pursued graduate school was things when things really shifted for me, um, the week or two weeks before graduate school, I lost a big chunk of my sight and I doubted whether or not I should go through with pursuing school and taking on student loans and moving away from my family and all of those things. And I decided to do it anyway. And the first year of school was hands down the hardest year of my life. I mean, I was on the outside. I probably looked like I had it all together, but on the inside I was lost. I was in a dark place. I was hopeless. And um, I came through that on the other side after that first year of school, and I started spending some more time with this girl and in my class, and, and I spent more time with her, and I thought about my problems less, and I spent more time with her, and I felt better, and I got out of that rut, and before I knew it, I was proposing to this girl, and, and she's now my wife, and so that darkest period of my life led me to the best thing that's ever happened to me, and so it was through that transformation and that process where I truly came to believe with everything that I am, that everything happens for a reason. And there's this one quote, speaking of quotes by Christine Kane. And she says, sometimes when you're in a dark place, it feels like you've been buried, but you've actually been planted. And I lived that. I, I felt like I was buried for that first year of school. And I came out on the other side and three years later, I can see now that I was planted. And, uh, and so I trust that with everything that I am. And I trust that with my eyesight. And I know that this is happening for a reason and, uh, and it helps me cope with it big time. Dude, that is one of the coolest quotes I've ever heard. And <laughs> you talking about being authentic and speaking from experience, like that is literally like the perfect quote for you to have and then be able to share with other people. Talk a little bit about your wife. Um, yeah. I find being an entrepreneur, coaching others, wanting to do so many things and then prioritizing the other people in your life is a challenge, but it's one of those challenges that I try and look at. And it's like, I don't want to just excel in one mm -hmm. area. I want to excel in as many areas as I can prioritizing certain that in certain seasons, how do you make her your priority? Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's been a challenge to be honest. So we've been married for seven months. We got married in the beginning of the pandemic and it was a wedding that didn't look anything like we thought it would. Um, but it was special and it was perfect. And so we got married on a Saturday and the following Wednesday, she had emergency surgery because her appendix burst. And so our like fifth day of marriage, was spent apart. She was in the hospital having emergency surgery. I couldn't visit because this was in the beginning of the pandemic. And so we spent that night apart. And then the following week I spent, uh, you know, I basically didn't sleep. I was up every night taking her temperature. She had a fever. We were afraid she had an infection. And so that first week was the most selfless I had been in my entire life. And I wasn't upset about it. I wasn't phased by it. I didn't even think about it, to be honest, because in the, that week, she was way more important than I was. And so I was running on basically empty, but I had all this energy because I was caring for somebody who I, that I loved. Um, and so that was how our marriage started. And then ever since then, we've been getting used to this, the ebb and flow of, of pandemic life. And we've both been lucky enough to be working full time. And it's been a challenge because to be honest, I've been busier than ever in the best way possible. I mean, my, my coaching stuff has flourished. My, the newsletter has grown tremendously. I started the podcast with Sam. I've had opportunities like this to connect with incredible people. And as all of those things come up, I've noticed that my tendency is to take on everything that I can take on. And the thing that falls to the wayside is my time with her. And so that's something that as of late, I've been much more intentional about and to the point where I even block it off in my calendar. And it sounds kind of crazy, but you know, on Thursday nights, I have a block in my calendar that is time with my wife. And I try not to look at my phone. I try not to do anything work related. Um, and you know, we spend the weekends together, but it's definitely a struggle and uh, something that I'll probably get better at in time. Um, but I, I see it always probably being somewhat of a challenge just managing my time like that. Absolutely. 
Yeah. It's something that I've had to do recently is having mm. a hard stop to prioritize my girlfriend because we're obviously all locked in. There's so many people they can go see. She gets tired of our cat as great as our cat is, we think. But it's like you need that time. And you're you're a doctor, so you have that clinic time, but then you, you're taking on so many different things. So I love that approach of, of creating that intentional time with her and, and with mm. whatever it is that you're doing. I know that you do a really good job of that. Talk a little bit about being in the clinic. Uh, yeah. Obviously, went to grad school, got a doctorate in physical therapy. Uh, what kind of inspired you to go that route as a profession? And then just some of the things that you're seeing um, as kind of the tendencies as we're being in this like rounded mm. position, right? We can talk about that um, from a postural standpoint, but maybe just start with what got you into that uh, and what that experience has been like. For sure. Yeah. So I started off my college experience at Bucknell University out in the middle of the nowhere, Pennsylvania. Um, I was a molecular biology major. I loved organic chemistry. I loved all the nitty gritty stuff. And so I decided I, I might be interested in research. And so I took a spot in a research lab and we ran this experiment for an entire year. It was my entire sophomore year. And essentially without getting to too many details, the experiment was take 200 chicken eggs, split them up a hundred and a hundred, inject half of them with testosterone, inject half of them with saline, let them hatch. We took care of them for six weeks. That was the morning shift. So at six o'clock in the morning for six weeks, I weighed and fed 200 chickens and I watched them grow up and I got to know them. And then at the end of six weeks, we killed them all. We chopped their heads off. It sounds terrible. It was humane, right? They were put to sleep first and we dissected out their organs and, and we ran all these tests to see if there were any differences in, in their weight or where more of them were male or you know all these things. And after a whole year, we found nothing. And it was at that moment where I realized I had just spent an entire year of my life in a lab more or less by myself for six weeks with some chickens too. And, um, and I, I felt like I lost that year. And so I wanted to be with people. I feel like my strong suit is, is relating to people, connecting with people. And so I thought, well, I love exercise. I love helping people and I love connecting with people. And so those three things seem to fit perfectly with the profession of physical therapy. I, uh, I transferred to Rutgers, uh, moved closer to home, finished up there, got my degree in exercise science and kinesiology, and then went on to graduate school at Drexel, graduated in the spring of 2019 with my doctorate of physical therapy. And ever since then, um, it's been an awesome experience practicing and treating patients. I would say when I got into the field of physical therapy initially, when I went to school, when I made that decision, I thought that physical therapists fixed people. Like I was, I was so excited about learning the hands-on techniques and all of this knowledge that I was going to use to fix people. And as I got to, toward the end of school and spent more time in the clinic and then graduated, I quickly realized that physical therapists are far from fixers. Uh, in my opinion, a physical, great physical therapist is much like a great coach. They're there to guide people. Uh, and so one of the things I see in the clinic most often is low back pain. And we can talk about posture. We can talk about, um, you know, just over, we, we talk about everything biomechanical. But the thing that I find most fascinating is that you take two people with back pain, the same exact um, physical mechanism for back pain. One person has a great family life, a great job, this and that. The other person has just got divorced. Um, they had a death in the family. They lost their job. The person who has those negative external factors might go on to develop chronic severe back pain and the person who has the support outside of work and the great family life they might not have back pain for too long but the mechanical aspect is the same but everything else the psychosocial is very different and i find that very fascinating i think most people think people come to physical therapy because they have pain I think most people come to physical therapy because their pain got to a point where it stops them from being them and so one of my goals in the clinic is to understand who people are and who they want to be so that I can better help them get there. And I think that's, uh, that's probably what differentiates me from other physical therapists. And I know there are some other great physical therapists out there who are doing similar things. Um, but to me, human connection is kind of at the core of, of great healthcare. 
Is there anything from a research standpoint that kind of scratches that itch of wanting to go and, and for six weeks weigh these people <laughs> <laughs> the chickens and, and see and see like what's causing the socioeconomic to cause mm. that? Like the first thing that comes to my mind, they're maybe chronically more stressed. They have less access to exercise or something like that. And so the lack of movement, the lack of poor breathing patterns leads to that. But is there anything that yeah. you would be able to dive into with that? Or is that you know, just kind of a, a theory? You know, it's a, it's a theory. There is a ton of research to back it up. I, I couldn't cite any off the top of my head, but one of the most fascinating things to me is when, when people come in with back pain, um, there seem to be like two categories of people. There are people who are really afraid of movement and people who just want to get better. The people that are afraid of movement, like fear of movement is, is a negative indicator of how someone's going to do uh, in physical therapy, but just in general with, with their rehab. Um, and so I think instilling confidence and reassuring and encouraging people um, is, is a really great therapeutic treatment, even though it might not be measurable, so to speak. But again, I think as Albert Einstein said, not everything that counts can be counted and not everything that can be counted counts. And so um, there's actually a book called Compassionomics, which talks about the science behind how compassion actually leads to better statistical results and outcomes in healthcare. I would highly encourage anybody who's interested to read that book um, because it gives you all the research that you would want. That's super cool. Yeah, I'll definitely yeah. check that out. Um, you are you able to straddle hmm. the fence where someone who's a coach or a trainer would have to refer out as a physical therapist. So it's really cool that you have that ability to carry someone through that. What would you say are the things that differentiate what a trainer or a coach should be addressing versus a physical therapist. Obviously you're, you're so much more yeah. well-versed in gross anatomy and yeah. what's happening at a biomechanical level. But I saw a post recently that was talking about just how much someone would need to invest if they invested in someone who niched down so yeah. much that they couldn't help beyond training. So they're like, I don't know anything about mobility. You got to talk to this person. And they're like, I don't know anything about nutrition. You got to talk to this person. They're like, I don't know anything about psychology. And all of a sudden people have 10 coaches just yeah. to get healthier. So I find that dichotomy super interesting. Where are you yeah. going to sit with that? Yeah, definitely. I see it as a continuum. And one of the reasons why I view myself as somebody who can, can span that whole continuum, that whole spectrum is because I do have the training background. I do have the coaching background, but then on the other side, I have the doctorate. And so for me, you know, physical therapy on the one end is for people who are quote unquote injured or in pain or need some type of advanced biomechanical assessment by a healthcare professional who's trained. Um, and then on the other end, you have just your regular personal trainer who took an online course and got their certification. Um, but I think that it really depends on the person. And if there are any physical therapists out there who are listening to this, they might not like what I have to say next, but there are some personal trainers, Paul, you're probably a great example who are way more qualified to interact with and deal with a patient or a person who's going through an injury than some physical therapist out there. Um, it really just comes down to your ability to connect with people, um, to progressively overload people, because at the end of the day, that's a lot of what physical therapy is. It's figuring out how much load can someone tolerate based on the state of their tissues, based on their previous training experience and X, Y, and Z. If you understand those things and you listen to your patient and you take it step by step, I mean, there are excellent trainers out there who can do better jobs than some of the physical therapists, I'll be honest with you. And so to me, it's a continuum. Um, and, and as long as you have the background, knowledge, and I guess confidence is, is a big thing too, dealing with people with various injuries, I think there's a lot of gray area in the middle of that continuum. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. And kind of a common thread between all of that is just continuing to be curious and learn and assume that you know absolutely nothing. And even after 10 years or a doctorate, it's like you still have so much to learn. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, I get caught between, oh, I need another cert and thinking that mm -hmm. like, then I'll know enough with like, no, I want to learn because I'm just a lifelong learner. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think, I think uh, to that point, like something I've been thinking about a lot recently is being, um, just in love, falling in love with the process without being attached to the outcome. And so uh, I read a lot of stuff by um, Seth Godin. Do you know who Seth Godin is? Yeah. He's yeah. Very smart. 
Yeah. So uh, I was listening to a podcast he was on the other day and he was talking about in Turkey, when you buy a loaf of bread at a bakery, you usually buy two loaves of bread and you say to the baker, put the second one on the hook. And they have these hooks hanging from the ceiling and they'll put the second loaf of bread, kind of like buy one for yourself, buy one for someone else and just pass it along. And then someone who's hungry can come in and say, you know, do you have anything on the hook? And they can take a loaf of bread. And he likened that to um, content creation, to writing, to videos, to whatever it was. And he said, you have to be willing to, to put your content on the hook. And so if you're a writer, that means putting your writing out there for people to see, regardless of what the outcome is. Um, if, you're, if you're recording podcasts, it means falling in love with that process and just putting it out there, putting it on the hook. And if someone's interested, they can come by and take it. And uh, I thought that was really cool because I think, I think that applies to a lot of things in life, including personal training and, and getting certifications and sometimes being more focused on the process and not just the certifications or the outcomes. Yeah, absolutely. So I have two thoughts with that. One is a quote. Uh, I was just looking over because I got my, my shelf right here. And so I got uh, <laughs> Purple Cow by Seth Godin, which I found super fascinating. All marketers are liars, but it's yeah. crossed out tell stories. I want to say there's a couple more in there, but I just can't spot them out. But what you're talking about reminds me of a quote uh, where it's basically to the effect of if you have something that can help someone and you don't share it with them because you're worried about it being perfect, you're an asshole. And so <laughs> ever since then, I've been like, all right, as long as I can help someone get from point A to point B, even if I don't have the whole alphabet memorized, like at least I can help them get there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think that that's super important as a physical therapist you do have to get people from point A to point B to actually progress and hopefully in a way like leave your service and, and go live their life. What are some of the things that you found effective in getting people to flip the switch towards like, I have to do exercises that they give me. Otherwise I'm going to be back in here in six weeks. Yeah. Um, so I would say to that experience is the best teacher. And there are definitely people who are back in six weeks or are back six months later or next year. And they realize then um, that maybe they didn't take as much ownership as they needed to uh, in the rehab process. Um, but when I am creating a program for someone outside of the clinic, I really frame it as a team approach. And so I wish my clinic had a whiteboard. I've been on them for a while about trying to get one, but essentially at the end of every evaluation, I'll just use a piece of paper and I'll separate it out into three columns. And on one column, it's the patient. This is your priority or responsibility outside of the clinic. This is what I need you to do. And maybe it's a couple of exercises a couple times a week. And then the next column is like, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to research X, Y, and Z. I'm going to create the best plan possible. And I'm going to use these manual techniques to help you with this. And then the third column is, is us as a team. And this is what we're going to do together. Um, and when I frame it like that, they understand that I have a responsibility. They understand that they have a responsibility and together we're working as a team. And if one of those parts doesn't work, then the whole thing isn't going to work. So that's been helpful for me. And then the other thing is just making things meaningful. I mean, it's one thing for me to tell someone do three sets of 10 of this exercise at home, but it's another thing to say, do three sets of 10 of this exercise at home because it's going to make this muscle stronger so that you can better lift up your grandson and play with him. Right? Like it has to be meaningful. It has to have some kind of meaning for the patient or else they're not going to do it. Um, I also sometimes will use the analogy. It's like brushing your teeth, you know, people, you know, if you brush your teeth for nine hours, one day and don't do it for the rest of the year, um, you're going to get cavities. Your teeth are going to fall out. It's the same with these exercises. We have to target consistency rather than intensity. Um, I just need you to do a little bit a couple times a week and we got to stay on top of it. So those things have been helpful for me, but to be honest, still a struggle, man. Yeah, dude, I love that. The whole idea of a whiteboard, because I have a whiteboard at my gym and I'll sometimes do like whiteboard education, create an analogy and education, giving them the reason why, how this is going to affect them, the reason why things are happening the way that they're happening, that leads to adherence, that leads to yeah. going and like doing it because you understand the reason why. One of my favorite examples of telling someone, hey, you need to do this because you're, you know, you're, uh, whatever quadratus laborum is is tight and they're like yeah 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 and like that's when i go to the the car dealership and they're like hey 
your motivator's got a blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, got it. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I'm not, yeah. not going to go get my car fixed. I, I have no idea what he's talking about. But we don't want to sound like an idiot, so we just say, yeah, 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 yeah. I know what yeah. you're talking about. Yeah. Um, that's super cool. I I definitely will apply that to what I do and anyone yeah. that works. I, one of my clients actually is, always talks about – listening to you and listening to sam and so, really uh yeah wow. shout out to shout out to joey he was talking about you guys on on saturday but he's a doctor and you know he can take that with this as well yep yeah i uh i have a quick story about kind of the whole compliance thing getting people on board i was treating a patient when i was a student actually and i didn't know what this person did for their profession and so whatever on the weekend i had a saturday morning dentist appointment went to the dentist and the hygienist was my patient and so she was going to clean my teeth. And uh, I always feel the need to confess to them that I, I haven't been keeping up with my flossing because I'm terrible at it. And I know they can tell and I feel guilty. So I said, listen, I'm sorry, but I haven't been flossing. And without skipping a beat, she said, it's okay. I don't do my home exercises. And at that moment, I kind of got it. Like to me, exercise is super important and meaningful. And I understand that. And so I do it. But for me, flossing, like, I don't get, I don't get it. It's not meaningful to me. And so I don't do it. And so that was the moment where I realized I need to make these things meaningful for people or else they're not going to, they're not going to be on it. Yeah. Uh, confession to your hygienist. I need to floss better as well. <laughs> um, I want to switch gears just a little bit. And I mean, it's kind of in the same vein of everything we're talking about, but it's like, you're very like, if it's on my calendar. If I'm supposed to do it, like knock it out. And we're a lot in the same way and, and we're just kind of binary and I've heard mm -hmm. you use the word rigid and it's a word that I use with myself a lot. What are some of the pros and cons that you've noticed with being so like it's this way or it's that way? Cause yeah. in the, in the health and wellness space, especially there's not a whole lot of subjectivity. It's like, if you don't do this, there's a scientific thing that's going to happen, right? If you aren't adhering to this program, like then there's science behind like lack of progression or whatever it is. Hmm. Yeah, and something that's like art based, movies, creativeness, right? There's like nuance and there's the gray area. And I find that so hard to find in, <laughs> I, it's and not even just you and I, it's anyone I listen to in the personal development space, even where they're just like, I don't do that. That doesn't help me. Boom, mm -hmm. boom, 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 boom. How do you deal with that? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I am very rigid. It's something I've been my entire life. Uh, structured maybe is another word you would use. Inflexible, as my parents might say. Um, but you know, there there are pros to that. You know, I get a ton of stuff done. I am super productive. I'm very efficient. I'm very effective. I have no problems with deadlines or handling a lot because I know how to handle a lot. I can I can structure that. Um, but on the flip side, when you're rigid and you have to pivot and you have to be flexible and maybe you're going to your in-laws house for the weekend or, or you're going to their cabin and they don't have internet and you can't get all of your coaching stuff done that you wanted to get done. Um, there's anxiety that comes along with not being able to stick with your structure. And I think one of the things I've been working on for a long time now is being able to more go with the flow and let go of the things I can't control and then come back to them at a, at a later time and, and trying my best to restructure. And so um, one of the things that I do at night that allows me to kind of turn off, I know you had mentioned you kind of have a hard stop at night so you can spend that time with your girlfriend. It's just a brain dump. And so before I kind of turn everything off for the night, I'll write down on a piece of paper, everything that I have to do for the next day or everything I'm thinking about. And if it's down on paper, then I can truly shut off and just get it out of my head and be more flexible and go with the flow because I don't have anything structured. It's structured on that piece of paper for tomorrow morning, but my life can be a little bit more free flowing. So there are definitely pros and cons and I'm working to, to be more flexible and be more adaptable because I think there are a lot of pros that go along with that as well. Yeah. It's interesting. It's like, it's what makes you successful. And so in a way it's not a bad thing and there's certain quality or certain personality traits and qualities that we all have that we're never going to like, I'm never going to just flip and all of a sudden become this musician musician. I mean, actually side note, my, one of my goals for next year is to learn the piano nice. and sing. But I think to that point, it's like just shifting 
that one or 2% to find a little bit more balance to that. Because again, I'm very much the same way at night. If I've got a bunch of I call them tabs open. So if I got 10 mm-hmm. tabs open on my, on my computer in my brain, I'm like, all right, I have to write these down. Otherwise I'm going to forget them or I'm going to go to bed being like, I haven't reached out to this person. I haven't mm-hmm. sent this email. Like this podcast needs to get recorded. <laughs> like who's going to edit it? Blah, 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 blah. Um, and so I like that. Like the, the other thing too, is even carving out time for, I've heard you talk about this for just spontaneity. Yeah. It's my, it's my Saturdays, most of my Saturdays. So sometimes my wife will work on Sundays. So I made Saturday my spontaneous day, uh, kind of wake up without plans. And usually we end up doing something pretty fun. And by fun, I mean like going to Target or doing things that are fun during a pandemic. But um, yeah, Saturdays are kind of my flexible, go with the flow, do whatever kind of day. And, um, and they're, you know, really enjoyable. You know, and I, I think if I were to do that more than one or two, two days a week, it would probably eat at me on the inside. But for right now, one or two days a week of less structure is actually really nice. Yeah. I, and again, it's like that in a periodized program, you have a deload or you mm-hmm. have that, that taper down so that you can be your best and you can't just go hundred miles an hour. I confession took Thursday and Friday off of my training program. Uh, I recently went on Adderall. I've had ADHD my whole life, but finally I was just like, all right, let's see if this can help. Uh And it's my whoop score. My recovery has been trash and I can just like scaling down because I'm not figuring out how to manage that with working out with when to take it, the dosage. So my, my sleep, I'm waking up a ton. I'm not hungry. I'm currently trying to um, build a ton. So I don't want to eat. And then I have to eat 1500 calories at 8 (laughs) PM. Where was I going with that? My brain just totally darted. I'm going to switch it totally um, freestyle this one. You talk about having that spontaneity day on Saturdays outside of a pandemic. What would you like ideally be doing? Yeah, actually, I think outside of a pandemic, my life gets a lot harder, to be honest. And I know that sounds crazy because for, for a lot of people, the pandemic has been a tough time. I have to be honest, for me, it's, it's been probably the best six, seven month stretch of my life. Um, and I think a lot of that is because I have so much on my plate and I have so much that I want to do. It's not that it's just on my plate. I'm actively taking these things on because I genuinely enjoy them and I want to do them. And the pandemic kind of affords me that time because there aren't people saying, hey, let's go grab dinner this night or hey, come to this party on this day. It's pretty much just me and my wife doing our thing at home and it gives me a lot of time. And so I think outside of the pandemic, to be honest, I don't know what my life looks like yet because I've never been, I've never been married outside of the pandemic. I've never had that other person in my life that, um, you know, I have to give that time to, and then also connect with other people in that social setting outside of the marriage. So to be honest, I'm not sure what it looks like, but I I do see it being a challenge for me and, and probably a good challenge. Um, but it's definitely gonna be harder to be as structured once the pandemic's behind us. Do you, do you feel like you run with a pretty tight circle? I do. You know what? I, it's weird. I have a group of maybe three or four guys who I'm really, really, really close to. And then I probably have like a hundred other people who I'm medium close to who, you know, I text on a biweekly basis or, you know, catch up on a phone call once a month. And so I have that core tight group, but then I also have a lot, a lot of kind of medium relationships going on. Yeah. That's one thing that has been really interesting is I'm still able to work with clients when Mm. most people are like locked in. So I feel like I get my interpersonal communication and people time. Right. And the other people that I'm connecting with is like on podcasts or just conversations in zoom to kind of charge me up and inspire me outside of a pandemic. I would probably say I'm doing the same thing Mm. pretty like structured having that one or two days. I think the one thing that I do miss is just getting out of town um, like I love just exploring and, and meeting different people and, and different cultures. And, you know, maybe it's like a different high rocks race or something like that and connect mm-hmm. with people. But it's, it's interesting. It's like the creative constraint. I actually kind of like, because mm-hmm. now I'm like, great, I have less things to think about. And I can just focus on what I need to focus on. Yeah, for sure. And, and the other part of it too, is it, social media gets a bad rap. I think a lot of people see the negatives or at least hear about the negatives, but there are so many positives. Like I would never, we would never be here if it weren't for social media. Like I wouldn't know 
hundreds of people that I know through social media. I wouldn't have had the hundreds of opportunities I've had if it weren't for social media. Um, I think it's demonized, but I, I really like I've connected with some of the most genuine, authentic people I've ever met in my entire life. And I've never met them, uh, which is just crazy. Yeah, it's super true. crazy. It, it, a year from now, I think it would be so cool to, whether it's something you and Sam put on or something where it's just like, hey, everyone we've connected with over the last year, get together. We're yeah. going to just ham on some sort of trail run or run yeah. into the woods and camp. I don't know what it would be. Um, I remember what that brain fart was. I took two days off training because I was totally just burnt out and I felt like a piece of slob because <laughs> I, I missed two days. And I was like, what's going on? Um, speaking of training, I like to ask these personality questions because I find them fun. After a workout, whatever kind of workout you're like, you find the most challenging and exhausting that leaves you the hungriest. What yeah. is like the one meal where you're like, I need to smash this. You want to know something really embarrassing. I've never said out loud for, um, let's see last year, high school, first three years of college. So four years after every single workout, I ate in a Tupperware container, two cups of sticky white rice, two bananas and two scoops of protein powder. That was my go-to meal. I would literally sit in my car with a plastic spoon, eating two cups of sticky white rice, two bananas, and two scoops of chocolate protein powder. Um, so like right, right now, um, I probably just have a protein shake and a couple pieces of fruit or kind of whatever's available um, because my schedule is all over the place. But in the past, that was the go-to. Sticky white rice, bananas, protein powder. That's really funny because a lot of people will ask the question, like, what's the weirdest thing that you eat that people think is normal? And when you said sticky white rice, banana, I was kind of going the angle of like, oh, maybe it's like it's some sort of like Thai dish that he like <laughs> loves, right? You'll do like the mango and the sticky rice. And then nope. you're like, and protein powder. Like, oh, uh, Mine is um, tapatio. Mm. or some sort of hot sauce and cottage cheese i call it just like basically like spicy protein um but i mean i think the thing that's funny is they're both like these weird things but it's like <laughs> because i gotta get my protein in so yep. that i get like the the ultimate workout in um kind of in the same vein top one or two favorite songs to work out to um you know what recently so it really switches it's eclectic for me monster by kanye west just puts me in the zone and um one last breath by creed mm. i'm a big like 90s classic rock guy so i like that kind of stuff and cool. then for, for some reason it's just kind of like the tone of monster by kanye just gets me fired up yeah kanye's got a lot of songs that can mm. get you just amped to work out so i or definitely definitely uh vibe with both of those is there anything that you're working towards like training towards or goals? I know a lot of things got shut down and you're probably training for like seven Ironmans, but is there anything specifically that you're working, working towards? Yeah. So last year I was training for a half Ironman, but it got canceled. Um, and I actually switched my registration from this past September in 2020 to 2021 in August in Maine. And uh, three days after I switched my registration to Maine, a woman got killed by a great white shark in the exact spot in the ocean where the swim happens. So I canceled that and I'm still looking for another race, uh, half, half Ironman, ideally. So right now I don't have anything on the books. Um, I wouldn't say I'm a runner by nature. And the world of endurance sports is very, very, very appealing to me because I feel like one of my strong suits is just pushing through pain and just suffering for lack of a better term. Um, but right now I'm just training for fun. So I do a mix of kind of spin bike workouts, bike workouts, outdoors, a lot of lifting like four or five days a week, and then a little bit of running and I just yeah. kind of mix it up. Would you say you're more fast twitch or do you like the endurance stuff? I think I'm naturally more fast twitch, but I actually enjoy the endurance stuff way more. Like if I could, like my ideal workout is like two hours, headphones in, head down, dark room on a spin bike, just hurting. Like I know wow. it sounds crazy. Like my legs burning, my lungs burning, sweat dripping off of me. Like that's, I love that stuff. That's interesting. It's uh, a, yeah. I am very slow twitch and mm. the running and the spinning. Like I like that if it's a good environment of mm -hmm. like lights down music playing yeah. uh, 
but I'm kind of just like a just low rhinoceros that loves doing stuff that's either like really long distance or maybe like more hypertrophy work. So yeah. that's super because you are now, you are jacked and you've obviously been <laughs> training for a really long time. Um, okay. And so I'm sure you, you've got a lot of variety in which you can go. Yeah, I appreciate that. I actually, I wanted to ask you because we didn't get to talk about it in depth when you were on our podcast, but you ran your marathon sub three hours. Is that the first marathon you ever ran? Yes. I basically That's in nuts. training, I was supposed to run 19 okay. and I got to a point where I was like, I feel kind of good. Might as well just run <laughs> the other seven. And I, I mentally told myself, this is getting me to a mental spot to where like, there's no surprises. Like I can tell myself I've been here before and that was three fourteen. Mm-hmm. but keep in mind that was like, not planned. I ran in a long sleeve shirt, didn't have water, <laughs> uh, two days prior, like we'd gone out with some friends. And so I was like really tired, kind of hung over the day before. So I rested. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I, I ran that sub three on the day that I planned. It was supposed to be a race, uh, took it, did everything right on that day, like rested tapered, but so I would say, yeah, for the most That's part, nuts. but, uh, well, what's the pace? What's the minute per, per mile breakdown? 647. There? That's, that's nuts, man. Yeah. It's, nuts. uh, it's interesting. Cause I went from that and now I'm three months into basically like building everything back up. I'm actually probably heavier than I was at my college weight playing baseball hmm. and definitely stronger than, and like everyone's starting to sign up for races that would be like high rocks or these endurance things. I'm like, man, I don't know. (laughs) Here's and go all the way back. But, um, I don't know. I think the, the net net thing that I love and obviously you love is just walking up to the edge of the cliff and seeing like how close you can get to that edge without like burning out or injuring yourself because that's when you feel most alive. Yeah, definitely. And I've, I've definitely fallen off that cliff multiple times in, in my journey. Uh, my early days, like I started, I was in the weight room pretty consistently when I was like 13, 14, I'd walk a mile to the gym after school and then walk home like after two hours in the gym. And, um, I just looking back, I was just burning myself. I was just spinning my wheels. It was, it was bad, but I learned my lessons and, um, I have a fear of heights, but, but, um, hypothetically, yes, I get close to the edge and I, I try not to fall off. Yeah. The, that's one thing I wish I would have done. I didn't hit the weight room till I got mm. to college and mm. it definitely showed. And I think that's why everything's so slow twitch. Um, yeah. I think when you train younger, that growth, um, yeah. I don't know. Anyway, science stuff. Um, <laughs> one last question. Sure. Dead alive. could be Darth Vader. Could be someone who is real. Uh, if you could sit down and have dinner, three hour dinner, eating whatever you're eating. Um, one, maybe two people that you'd love to have a conversation with. I would love to sit down and have dinner with Inky Johnson. Um, do you know who he is? No, you're going to have to give some background. Oh, cool, cool. All right, this is awesome. So um, Inky Johnson is a guy who I look up to and probably one of the reasons that I have the outlook about my eyesight that I have. And so this guy grew up in, in poverty, really, you know, tough situation. And his goal was to make it to the NFL so he could provide for his family and, and get his family out of the situation that they were in. And so he grew up, he got a scholarship to the University of Tennessee. He played football there. He was doing great. He was projected to be, you know, a top 10 draft pick. And in one of his last games at the University of Tennessee, he was a cornerback. He went to make this hit on a receiver catching a ball and he hit the guy and his body just went limp and he fell to the ground and they rushed him to the hospital into emergency surgery. And uh, he busted open his subclavian artery and he had some nerve damage to his brachial plexus. And, you know, he woke up from the surgery and the doctor said like, Inky, we saved your life, but we have some bad news. And, um, you know, we're not, we weren't able to, to save the function of your arm. And so his one arm was paralyzed and he would never be able to use it again. And that's what they told him in rehab. You'll never be able to use this arm again. And um, he set out to prove them wrong. And he said, I will use this arm. I'll use this arm every day um, by the way I live to set an example for people that anything is possible. And he couldn't play in the NFL, but he became a motivational speaker. Um, and, and he made an excellent living for himself. And he's one of the most inspirational people that I've ever seen. Um, he's a captivating speaker. I mean, just the passion in his voice is unreal. And um, 
you know, it's just, it's incredible to see the faith that he has, that there's something bigger planned for him and that everything's happening for a reason. And so watching him trust that and embrace that and just grow through that um, really inspired me to try to do the same with, with my eyesight. And so if I can sit down with one person, it would probably be him. That's super cool. Yeah. Inky, that's a good name too. Yeah. You have also have a good strong name. We talked about that on your podcast yeah. as Thank well. You. Um, awesome. Dude, where can people find you, connect with you? Obviously want to get people subscribed to your newsletter um, and just like following the awesome stuff you're doing. Yeah. So the best place to contact me would probably be Instagram. And so it's Joe Rinaldi DPT that stands for doctor of physical therapy. And uh, in the link in my bio is my blog. So it's Joe Rinaldi blog. And through the blog, you can find links to my weekly newsletter uh, to the podcast to all of my writing. And uh, I would absolutely love to connect with anybody who's listening. Um, even if, if I don't know you or, or you don't think I'll respond, I promise I will. And uh, I'm looking forward to hearing from, from anybody who wants to reach out. Yeah, absolutely, dude. Um, well, then again, thank you so much for the time uh, and look forward to in the near future, hopefully connecting face-to-face. Uh, Definitely. Going, going for a two-hour two bike ride. <laughs> Sounds good, Paul. Thanks right. for having me on, man. Absolutely. Before I let you go, just want to say thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Be sure and share the podcast with anyone that you feel would get something out of it. Tag Joe and I on social media so that we know that you're listening. And last but not least, we'd really appreciate uh, if you leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Let me continue to grow the podcast so that we can get other people on and bring more value to you going into 2021. Got some really big goals with the podcast uh, and want you to be a part of that. If you've got any questions or want to reach out, you're interested in mindful muscle or just connecting, you can hit me up, paul at downdogathletics.com via email or find me on social media, paul underscore Klingon on Instagram. Other than that, you guys go have an awesome rest of your day. Crush 2021. You guys got it. I'll catch you guys next time on the Mindful Muscle Podcast.